Hello you, I do hope you're well. Welcome to this AQA A-Level Religious Studies video. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are revising the first topic on paper two, which is sources of wisdom and authority. So we will be talking through the Bible, the church and Jesus as sources of wisdom and authority for Christians. And we'll be going through your AO1 knowledge and of course your AO2 evaluation points as well. So just to be really clear, the three different sources of of wisdom and authority for Christians are the Bible, the church and Jesus. And we will be looking through, as I say, your AO1 knowledge and your AO2 evaluation points for each. And that is in preparation for these potential 10 mark and 15 mark questions. So we could be asked to examine two different Christian views about the authority of the Bible. We could be asked to examine different Christian views on the authority of the church. And we could also be asked to examine how the belief that Jesus's authority was God's authority would influence the attitude of Christians to his teaching. We'll also be preparing for these potential 15 markers. The Bible should be the only source of authority for Christians. The church is the most important source of authority for Christians. Christians, and Jesus Christ's authority was from God. So we will be keeping those questions in mind as we go through the AO1 and AO2 content. And also, of course, remember, you can talk about and you should talk about the sources of wisdom and authority in your 25 mark dialogues questions as well. Because whenever you're talking about Christian beliefs, views or teachings on a topic, you are, of course, always going to be linking back to what the Bible says, to what Jesus said and did, and of course, to what the church has taught as well. So let's get started with our first source of wisdom and authority, which is the Bible. So the word Bible itself means book. And of course, the Christian Bible contains the Old and New Testaments. There are a total of 66 different books. The Old Testament contains writings shared with Jewish scripture. Very importantly, we've got Genesis in there as the first book of the Bible, where, of course, the creation stories can be found. And that key teaching from Genesis is that God created everything out of nothing. And of course, our key Latin phrase is creation ex nihilo. The New Testament contains Christian writings, including the four Gospels that record the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And then also St. Paul's letters, very important and very influential as well on many different topics such as sexuality and gender. There are four different views that we are going to look at today as part of our evaluation of the Bible. So they will help us to consider different Christian views on the authority and therefore the importance of the Bible. We will start with the evangelical Protestant view of Sola Scriptura. We will be looking at the Catholic view and we will also be looking at the neo-Orthodox view as well as the Sea of Faith Network view. And of course, you need to make a judgment as to which of these different views is correct. So let's get started with the evangelical Protestant view. And this can be described as a fundamentalist view of the nature and authority of the Bible. And that is because an evangelical Protestant would see the Bible as the inerrant and infallible word of God. So they believe it contains no mistakes, it is inerrant. So, of course, whatever the Bible says, they are going to take seriously. They are going to believe it has absolute authority. And a great quote about this is from A. Skevington Wood, who said, let us not change the word of God. So we shouldn't be changing the Bible or adapting it to suit our, our understandings of the world. We ourselves should be changed through the word. It is by the standard of scripture that the believer is enabled to measure all other teaching. And of course, that then lends itself to that sola scriptura idea that the Bible is the most important source of authority. And so you should always be turning to the Bible when you are making a moral decision or you are deciding whether something is right or wrong, because it is the standard of scripture which you should then use in terms of making moral decisions and as we read there, measuring all other teachings. Now, important that we actually then think about what this means in terms of the beliefs an evangelical Protestant would hold. Because, of course, if you believe that the Bible is infallible and inerrant, then you are going to take what it says very seriously. And we can apply that to things like creation, but we can also then apply it to teachings on things like gender and sexuality as well. So it is important we know that when it comes to understanding Genesis, many evangelical Protestants are literalists. 
They believe that creation occurred about 6,000 years ago based on biblical dating and that it took place over six literal days followed by a day of rest. And that is because that's what it literally says happened in Genesis 1. And remember, evangelical Protestants believe the Bible is the infallible and inerrant word of God. And of course, the implication of that is they would then reject scientific explanations such as the Big Bang and the theory of evolution because Genesis 1 doesn't say, and then God caused a Big Bang or that God then started off the process of evolution. Genesis 1 says it was a six day process followed by a day of rest. And so for a literalist, they believe that means that is what literally happened. And so they would reject those scientific explanations as inconsistent. And for all evangelical Protestants, whether they are a literalist or not, they believe in something called sola scriptura, which of course was one of the key principles of the Protestant Reformation that was spearheaded by Martin Luther. And sola scriptura is the belief that the Bible should be the only source of religious authority. Now, that's not to say that in the Protestant tradition, you should not have a priest, because of course, we know that Protestant churches do have leaders. But the important thing is, it is always the Bible that has the ultimate authority and has the final say, that is that standard by which everything else should be measured. So it is then, uh, you know, a really important part of the Protestant tradition that they believe in the priesthood of all believers, that everybody should be able to read the Bible for themselves and make sense of it for themselves. So you should always be turning to the Bible. So for your evangelical Protestants, they believe in sola scriptura because they believe that the Bible is the infallible and inerrant word of God. Our second viewpoint then, which will help us to critique that first viewpoint by comparing it with a different way of seeing the Bible, is the Catholic view. So the Catholic Church has a different understanding of the Bible. They believe the Bible is still very important, but they believe the Bible has equal authority to the church itself. So the Catholic Church, of course, do not believe in sola scriptura. They believe that the Bible has equal authority to the church and it is the church's role to interpret the Bible, to make it make sense and to make it relevant to the issues that Christians face in the world today. So they believe that the Bible is inspired by God, but was written by human beings. So it didn't come down in a lift, fully formed and ready to go. They therefore believe, as I say, that the Bible has equal authority to the Catholic Church. And we will be talking about the church's teachings on um, apostolic succession in a few moments time. But for now, as we are focusing on the Bible, we just need to focus on their belief that the Bible has equal authority to the church. And we see this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is their official teaching document, which says, Sacred tradition and sacred scripture are bound closely together and communicate with one another. That should say, please do excuse my poor uh, typing there. So the church believes that it has an important role to play in interpreting scripture. So it's not scripture alone on a pedestal and protected and kept away, but actually scripture is used by the church and it is their job to then make it make sense to the people, to all of the 1.2 billion Catholics, or actually I think there are more now, but to all of the many Catholics around the world. So again, the church says that its magisterium has the duty of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God. So you can't just rely on scripture alone is the critique we're going to make here of sola scriptura. You can't just say scripture alone is enough. Scripture alone is the standard and the source of authority. You actually then need the experts, for example, the priests in the church and the church leadership all the way up to the Pope who can then make sense of scripture and who can give what the church calls an authentic interpretation of the word of God. And if we then think about what the church thinks about Genesis, which, of course, is the first book of the Bible, they do not believe it is literally true. So it's really important, you know, that Catholics are not literalists. They do not believe that God created the universe in six literal days, followed by a day of rest. Now, that is not to say that they don't believe in Genesis having any authority at all. They believe Genesis is very important because it contains spiritual and moral truth. So they look for the key messages. They see it as metaphorical. 
So, for example, the Genesis creation story conveys the message that God is omnipotent and that God created everything out of nothing, which, of course, in Latin means creation ex nihilo. But they don't believe it should be understood literally. They don't see the Bible as a scientific textbook. They think it was written in a pre-scientific era and it contains important moral messages and spiritual truth, but it is not literally true. And it's an important point to always remember and write about that the Big Bang Theory was actually pioneered by a Catholic priest. So, of course, he didn't see any contradiction between his Catholic faith and his discovery of the Big Bang Theory. So, again, that shows you that they don't see the Bible as literally true. And we see this in one of the encyclicals written by the church called De Verbum, which is Latin for on the word, referring, of course, to the word of God, which is the Bible. And this encyclical said the Bible is not meant to convey precise historical information or scientific findings. So that would be a critique of um, taking a literalist view of Genesis that actually the Bible, as I say, is not meant to be seen as a scientific account or a historical account. It contains important moral truth and spiritual truth, but it is not meant to be understood as literally true. And that is why Catholics then, if we link it to the paper two topic of science, would have no problem accepting scientific explanations such as the Big Bang and evolution. Pope Francis, for example, has said that the Big Bang theory does not contradict belief in God. So that is an important, really clear, concrete point on Genesis. So you can focus in your essay on a particular book of the Bible when you're talking about different understandings of the Bible, whereas many evangelical Protestants believe that Genesis is literally true. For a Catholic, it is not literally true. It still contains truth, but it is not literally true. Let's have a look at a third approach now, and this is the neo-orthodox approach, which is developed by Karl Barth. Now, hopefully his name is familiar from other topics on the course. He was a Swiss Protestant theologian who had a really interesting understanding of the Bible. He believed that the Bible is not the word of God, but that it contains the word of God. So I always remember this by thinking of it as a vehicle that the Bible is a vehicle. So the book itself, the paper itself, is not the word of God that's come down in a lift from heaven, but it contains the word of God because it contains the commandments God has given, for example, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, and it contains the teachings of Jesus. And of course, Christians believe that Jesus is the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So as I say, the neo-Orthodox view is that the Bible is a vehicle for the word of God. So the book itself is not the word of God. So the book itself is not inerrant, but it does contain the inerrant words of God because it contains divine commands given by God, such as the Ten Commandments, as well as the teachings of Jesus, who is the incarnate Son of God, who the Gospel of John says is the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so for Bath, the Bible is the way through which humans may experience God. And I'll say it again, it's a vehicle for us. So the book itself is not the word of God, but it contains the words of God. So it's not inerrant with respect to things like science, history and religion, because Bath is aware its writers were products of their time and they were subject to limitations of the intellect. But nevertheless, the Bible does still have authority because it contains the words of God. And there are some editions of the Bible where they will actually put everything Jesus said in a different colour. So they might put everything Jesus said in red, for example. And I think that's a really visual way to remember what Bath means here, that the Bible itself is not the word of God, but it contains the words of God. And that's why it has authority. So that doesn't mean that every single line in the Bible is literally true or is 100% correct, because of course he He's aware that the Bible was written by human beings who had received revelations of God or in the case of the Gospels had been followers of Jesus. But he said that doesn't mean the Bible has no authority. The Bible does have authority because it contains the word of God, because it contains. And this is a great quote from Bath: divine thoughts about men, not human thoughts about God. So it is still very authoritative. It is very important because it's through the Bible we can discover God's divine commands and we can, of course, discover what Jesus wants us to do as well. And of course, we know Bath because he is an exclusivist. He believes that there is salvation 
through nobody else. It is the doctrine of the Trinity, which fundamentally distinguishes Christianity from every other religion. But then the Bible's importance is because of what it contains, because it is a vehicle for the word of God. Now, you might be thinking, well, yeah, of course, that that is, you know, stating the obvious. But, you know, it's important to remember some people, such as evangelical Protestants, might just take a Bible and say that this book is the word of God. But Barth has been really clear and much more specific about what that actually means. The Bible has authority because it contains the words of God, because it contains divine commands, because it tells us about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And then our fourth approach, before we take a step back and make a judgment about which one is the most convincing understanding of the Bible and its authority, is a radically different one. This is a very liberal view. Some would argue this is not Christian. So a little bit like when we're talking about process theology and we're saying that that is not Christian because it's denying God's omnipotence and it is denying that God created everything out of nothing. You can use the sea of faith network to say, actually, this is incompatible with Christianity because the sea of faith network believes, and this is a general point they make, that religions and religious faith is a creation of the human imagination. So, you know, obviously this seems quite Freudian, doesn't it? I actually think Richard Dawkins could secretly be behind this because they regard religion as a human creation. Now, that's not to say that like Dawkins, they see religion as a negative thing or as Freud would see it as a neurosis. They're not saying that it's a bad thing, but they are saying that it's created by human beings. So just to give you some more information about them, I think I got this quote off their website. They are a shared, open-minded quest. I suppose I should say they are on a shared, open-minded quest for a rational and creative framework for the one life we have to live. So again, they're, they're rejecting belief in life after death. So again, is this a Christian group? In terms of what they believe about the Bible, they believe it was written by human beings who were writing in a particular historical context trying to make sense of the world around them. So they don't believe it's divine in origin. They believe it is human in origin. So of course, Karl Barth would not be happy about this because the Sea of Faith Network is saying that the Bible does contain human thoughts about God, about life, about the purpose of life. Whereas of course, Barth believes that it does contain the words of God in those divine commands and in those teachings of Jesus. So they would see it as a little bit like a self-help book, I suppose. It is human words giving humans guidance on how to live. So it is written by humans for humans. And so in terms of its authority, they've got quite an interesting take here because they believe it does still have authority if you give it authority. But that authority does not come from God. The Sea of Faith Network are great to use in an essay on the authority of the Bible because they're saying that its authority comes from you. So in the same way that, for example, one of my favorite self-help books is Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers. And I really recommend it to you. I also recommend my book, Be Your Best, available on uh, Amazon now, free 99. You might give that book authority in your life if you like what I've written. So in the same way that for me, Susan Jeffers has some brilliant quotes, things like feel the fear and do it anyway, which is the title of the book. And she also says, whatever happens, you can handle it. So I give that book authority in my life because I believe in what she's saying. I think that it's got some really brilliant ideas that have had a positive impact on my life. And in the same way, I feel like that about Susan Jeffers book you might feel that way about the Bible. And to be honest, I probably would say I feel that way about the Bible. I think there are some great quotes in there, things like clothe yourselves with compassion from St. Paul, for example. But the, the point here is it only has authority if you give it authority. It is your choice to give it authority because it has a positive impact in your life and it has a positive impact in how you navigate life. But the authority is not divine. The authority does not come from God. The authority comes from you choosing to give the book authority because you like what it says, because it resonates with you. You like the values it promotes. You like the teachings it gives. So for the Sea of Faith Network, they do believe it has authority if you choose to give it authority. But that authority is not from God. It is not external. It is from you choosing to give it authority. In the same way I've given Susan Jeffers' book, Authority, Somebody else might give, you know, a Tony Robbins book or a um, Stephen Bartlett book authority in their life because they think that the diary of the CEO has had a really positive impact on how they see life 
and how they navigate life. So there are the four different views on the authority of the Bible. And it's your job in an AO2 essay to be making a judgment as to which one is the most convincing. Are any of these approaches flawed? Which one of them is the most convincing, the most coherent? Which one do you think is the most truly Christian? Well, hopefully, as we now look at different beliefs about the church, you will gain more insight into your judgment. Because with the sources of wisdom and authority, you you could be asked a question about them in isolation, for example, on the Bible in isolation or the church in isolation or even Jesus in isolation. But it's important to remember that like the Trinity, they are interconnected because we learn about Jesus in the Bible. And of course, the Catholic Church believes that the Bible and church have equal authority. So we're going to keep going now with our next section of the video, which is to look at the church. And then towards the end, we'll be able to take that step back and again, reconsider those questions I shared at the start. So let's talk about the church. And we need to go back 2000 years to when Jesus rose from the dead and then he was about to ascend. So we're going back 2000 years because he, according to the Bible, again, there's a link between the topics, gave his apostles the authority to lead the church. And in particular, he gave that authority to St. Peter. He said to Peter, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. So that teaches us, well, that teaches Catholics, I should say in particular, that St. Peter, who was the first Bishop of Rome, was appointed by Jesus himself to lead the church. And then of course, in terms of why that's important for the Catholic church, the apostles then passed on their authority to new leaders and this transmission of authority continued. And that is known as apostolic succession. And that continues today because Pope Francis, who is the 266th Pope, he is also known as the Bishop of Rome. So he is the successor to St. Peter. And of course, at the Vatican, in the centre of the Vatican, the main square is called St. Peter's Square, St. Peter's Basilica. And that reflects the fact that the Pope's authority is traced all the way back to the authority that Jesus gave to St. Peter at the very beginning. And so in Western Europe, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is I don't know why I've put was, obviously the Catholic Church is still going strong, is still the leader of the church. Now, of course, it's important when we're then thinking about denominations to think about the splits that took place. So, for example, in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation took place when Luther nailed his 95 theses, his 95 complaints to the door of a local church, because that is when we saw some Christians led by Luther, rebelling against the Catholic Church. And as I've mentioned, Martin Luther was the key figure in this Reformation. In 1517, he nailed his 95 theses on a church door in Germany. And this included criticism of the Pope's authority because uh, Catholics believe the Pope has papal infallibility, that he can't be wrong. And so he has the final say on everything. He criticised the sale of indulgences, which is when the church was basically selling people salvation. So it's like me going around with a card machine saying, you know, $14.99 and I'll get you into heaven. Go on, tap now, get yourself in. Um, so they were selling indulgences, which he thought was terrible, and he was protesting against that. And also, he believed that salvation is through faith alone. So the Catholic Church was teaching that salvation was through faith and works, and that is the position they maintain today. He believed that we are saved through faith alone. And the Protestant Reformation established five solar principles which is five things alone that guarantee you salvation. They are uh, faith alone, scripture alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and glory to God alone. So the Catholic Church, for example, uh, quite like to talk about Mary and the Virgin Mary. And for Luther, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be giving glory to God alone. And so Protestant, as a word, is now an umbrella term for the many different denominations of Christian that are not Catholic or Orthodox. For example, Anglican, Baptist, Pentecostal. So it is important we know that the church began 2000 years ago when Jesus appointed Peter as the first Bishop of Rome. And then the key event for us when we're thinking about different beliefs on the authority of the church is the Protestant Reformation, which saw Martin Luther lead that rebellion against the Catholic Church. So let's start with the Catholic Church, the oldest church, of course, 
They are the oldest church and the largest church with over 1.3 billion followers. So, you know, Kylie Jenner, sit down, please. Now, the church is led by the Pope, who is currently Pope Francis. He is the 266th Pope, and he is also known as the Bishop of Rome. And that reflects the fact that his authority is traced back to the first Bishop of Rome, St. Peter, who was appointed by Jesus himself. And so Catholics believe the Pope has papal infallibility. And that's why they listen to and take seriously what he says. The Pope writes encyclicals on different important topics. Recently, he wrote one on climate change. And when he speaks, the world's Catholics listen because they believe his authority is inherited through um, apostolic succession and that he has papal infallibility. And the Catholic Church is centred at the Vatican City. The core beliefs of Catholicism are set out in the Nicene Creed. So have a Google of that if you want to refresh yourself. And remember, if we link back to beliefs on the Bible, they believe the Bible and tradition, also known as the church, have equal authority. So it's not Sola Scriptura, as Luther then developed. It is the Bible and church together with equal authority. So the church believes it has an important role as the guardian and interpreter of the Bible. So you can't just run off with your own Bible. You need the church because they are the guardian of it. They're the protector of it. And they're the interpreter of it. They're the explainer of it. They tell you and they show you how what scripture says is relevant in your everyday life. And they then guide you to salvation. So you can't be saved without the church. In terms of um, life as a Catholic, there are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. Um, we'll be looking, of course, at baptism and Eucharist for this exam, for paper two, when we compare with the Baptist ordinances of believers' baptism and Holy Communion. A Catholic in their life should complete six of the seven sacraments. So you have got infant baptism, Eucharist, confirmation, reconciliation and anointing of the sick, which is before you die. And then a Catholic should choose between marriage and holy orders. So in the Catholic Church, if you do become a priest and only men can become a priest, we'll look at that when we look at gender, you uh, become celibate. So you commit yourself to the religion, to your church, rather than to a family. So that is why you have to choose between those two sacraments. You either enter into lifelong monogamous marriage or you take holy orders. So the Protestant church are our second church. And the clue really is in the name here because the Protestant church developed in protest against the Catholic Church. So remember, it was Martin Luther in 1517 nailing his 95 theses to the church door in protest. So our second denomination, the Protestants, they developed in protest against the Catholic Church and their power. So our key event, our key point on the timeline here is the 16th century, when, of course, we saw the Protestant Reformation. And it was Martin Luther who led protest against the Catholic Church. And of course, as part of that, he established the five solas, including sola scriptura, which is scripture alone, and um, sola fide, faith alone. And we talk about that when we talk about justification, that you are saved through faith alone. The Protestants, remember, take the Bible very seriously indeed because of that sola scriptura belief. So the Bible gives the standard of measurement for deciding on the truth of church teachings. So unlike the Catholic Church, where they go hand in hand and they are side by side, the Bible takes precedence over the church. So it's more important than anybody or any priest. And that is why Protestants believe in the priesthood of all believers. Everybody should be able to read the Bible for themselves. For a Protestant, they believe salvation is through faith and not through the institution of the church. So remember, one of his big problems was the sale of indulgences. The idea that it's through entering the church, being a member of the church and then even paying the church that you can be saved. And Protestants, um, certainly Luther, would be against that. They would say that you can't pay your way into heaven, that the church can't say that it will decide or it will be the one that decides whether you go to heaven or not. So the institutional power of the church was taken away for Protestants. They instead believed that instead of having that strict hierarchy with someone having papal infallibility at the top, all Christians should have equal access to God through prayer and they should read the Bible for themselves. And that is, as I've mentioned, called the priesthood of all believers. Now, of course, you need to be thinking AO2 wise. Well, of course, that is great because it empowers the individual. You can say everybody's made Imago Dei. Everybody should be able to read the Bible for themselves. 
But as a criticism of that, you could say, but actually, you do need experts. You need the magisterium. You need the pope. You need the bishops who are experts in the religion to make sense of scripture for you. It could be quite overwhelming if you just say to someone, here's the Bible, off you go. You know, we know that in the Old and New Testaments combined, there are over 600 rules. So if you just give that to somebody and say, there you go, there's the word of God, how overwhelming is that? But if you've then got the, the church authorities who can help to make sense of scripture for you, can help interpret it and help people to navigate through it, that could be seen as a real benefit and as a real strength of the church and its hierarchy. But of course, your counter argument to that, your critical analysis of that is that the church leaders then exploit it. Because if you've got a pope with papal infallibility, what decisions could they make? Uh, and, you know, how could they maybe abuse that position? And of course, you could say that then undermines the idea of the Imago Dei, that if you've got one person at the top, with more earthly authority than anyone. And so that's why you need to have the Bible above the church, because that then sets the standard. It doesn't then, you know, become culturally relative. It doesn't then become too flexible and changeable, but actually it remains a constant and it remains a strong source of moral teachings. Because of course, if you bring in Bath here, it is the Bible that contains the word of God. Although of course the Catholic response would be that God continues to speak to the will today through the church. So plenty to think about in terms of RAO2. Now, an example of Protestant is the Baptist church. And we will talk about them when we talk about sacraments and expressions of Christian identity later on paper two. So they do not have any sacraments. Instead, they call them ordinances. They are believers baptism and holy communion. And an ordinance is where you act on an order given by Jesus. So he ordered, for example, to make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And he, he also ordered um, for holy communion, do this in remembrance of me. You also need to know about the Protestants um, is that it's on many issues that they differ from the church. And one of them is female ordination. So when we talk about uh, gender and sexuality, we'll make a distinction again between the Catholic traditionalist position uh, that women cannot be a leader in the church uh, because Jesus was a man and he only appointed men. And then the more liberal Protestant view, which is that women can now be ordained. We'll also look at the same on issues like priests being able to marry, uh, which Protestants do allow, and even same-sex marriage, which is now allowed in many Protestant denominations. Um, so lots to think about, lots to talk about in terms of the difference and the distinction between those two um, denominations, your traditionalist Catholic Church, which has been around 2000 years, and then the Protestant Church with the Protestant Reformation. And another one that's just come to mind is, of course, divorce, that you can get divorced in the Protestant Church, because, of course, Henry VIII got in on the Protestant Reformation and thought, well, if the Pope's not going to let me have a divorce, I'm going to create my own church within which I can get a divorce. So, of course, the Church of England began in protest against the Pope as well, because Henry VIII wanted a divorce. And, of course, the traditionalist Catholic Church said that you've become one flesh in the eyes of God. You cannot end your marriage. So Henry VIII did, of course, what anyone would do and started his own church so that he could get divorced within it. So what we are now going to look at is we're going to look at the final source of wisdom and authority, which is, or I should say, who is Jesus? Because we need to think about Jesus as a source of authority for Christians. And of course, he traditionally has absolute authority because he is the incarnate son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is, in his own words, the way, the truth and the life. So, of course, Jesus has absolute authority for Christians. To be a Christian means to be a follower of Christ. And, of course, they believe he is God incarnate, born at Christmas. He then taught people. He then um, healed people. He then ultimately died for people on the cross. His uh, death is the act of atonement that pays the price for sin. Remember, St. Paul said Christ died for our sins. And then, of course, his resurrection is uh, on Easter Sunday. And that is when, uh, according to the Gospels, the tomb was empty. He had risen from the dead. And that gives Christians hope for life after death themselves. Now, what we need to think about for the exam is where does Jesus's authority come from? Is it divine? So is he the incarnate son of God? Or does it come from a little bit like the Sea of Faith Network said about the Bible? Does it come from people liking what he said and believing in what he said? So choosing to give him authority because they agree with him. 
And I want to start this by thinking about Jesus as either the son of God or as a revolutionary man. So was he divine? Was he the incarnate son of God? Was he the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us? Or was he a revolutionary man? Was he, as Reza Aslan puts it, a zealous Galilean peasant who launched a rebellion against the temple authorities and the Roman rulers, but then was ultimately um, executed for this on the charge of insurrection. And that was then where the story ends with his rather gruesome, bloody, barbaric execution on the cross. So on the slide here for you, I have got a selection of quotes. Some of them that would support the idea he was the son of God, and those quotes are all from the Bible. And then some of them, which are from Reza Aslan, who was a historian of religion. Um, again, he is a historian of religion. Sorry, I don't know why I'm killing everybody off today and writing everybody off. Um, and he believed that actually Jesus was a really important man. He was a revolutionary man, but he was not the incarnate son of God, um, that actually he was a political revolutionary. And we'll talk about this more when we look at liberation theology later on paper two as well. I've also left a couple of boxes on the slide here for you to have a look at some more quotes that you think would prove Jesus is the son of God or that he is just a revolutionary man. And of course, that is all about the question of was Jesus's authority from God or did he have authority because people liked what he was saying? Were people following him because they wanted to join him in this political revolution where he was empowering the poor and he was challenging who, uh, you know, the rulers who he saw as hypocrites and as oppressive. So let's have a look at some of these quotes. The first one is from Reza Aslan, who said that Jesus's crime in the eyes of Rome was striving for kingly rule, the same crime for which nearly ever, every other messianic aspirant of the time was killed. So, of course, there he is saying that Jesus was a revolutionary man who was executed by the Roman state. Let's move uh, across to the right. So the Gospel of John says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So, of course, that would suggest that Jesus is divine, that he is the incarnate son of God. Our next quote, which you can't see because I'm in the way, do excuse me, is that Jesus was a zealous Galilean peasant and Jewish nationalist who donned the mantle of Messiah and launched a foolhardy rebellion against the corrupt temple priesthood and the vicious Roman occupation. So, of course, that would suggest he was a revolutionary man, that he was a political revolutionary. He's been described um, as a freedom fighter who wanted to overthrow the authorities because he thought they were oppressive, they were hypocrites, they were causing harm to the poorest in society. So he showed this radical preference for the poorest and he wanted to uh, transform society. Our next quote then is from Jesus himself. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the father except through me. So, of course, many Christians would believe that shows that his authority is from God, that he is the source of salvation, that he speaks with God's authority. And another quote that supports that is the next one to the right, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So that, again, is the idea that his authority is from God. He has given him authority. God has given him authority to rule over heaven and earth. Another quote that would support this very um, divine understanding of Jesus and his authority is John the Baptist, who said in the Gospel of John, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that really emphasizes that Jesus is your source of salvation, that his death on the cross is an act of atonement that pays the price for human sinfulness. To continue to the right, Reza Aslan said that Jesus recognised that the new world order he envisioned was so radical, dangerous and revolutionary that Rome's only conceivable response to it would be to arrest and execute them all for sedition. So, of course, that is, again, talking about Jesus as a revolutionary man because he wanted to transform the world. He was not talking about the kingdom of God as a future eschatological reality, but as a transformation of this world. He wanted to overthrow the rulers. He wanted to empower the poorest. He wanted to transform society. It was radical, dangerous and revolutionary. And that is why he was killed on the cross. So he didn't die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world as this act of atonement for sin. He died because the Roman rulers and the temple authorities didn't like what he was doing because they saw him as a threat to their authority. So his authority didn't come from God. It came from him and people then liking what he was saying and joining him with his revolution. 
The next one then is Pope John Paul II, who said the conception of Christ as a political figure, a revolutionary, as the subversive of Nazareth, does not tally with the church's catechism. So he is rejecting there what Reza Aslan then wrote about in his book. So he's rejecting there the idea in liberation theology that Jesus was this revolutionary figure. He says that we can't see Jesus as a political figure or as a revolutionary. He is divine. So John Paul II was very critical of the politicization, as he saw it, of Jesus. He said you can't see him as a political figure or as a freedom fighter. He transcends politics. He transcends society, ultimately, because he is um, a spiritual teacher and he is the incarnate son of God. So Pope John Paul II is very unhappy there with the depiction of Jesus as a political revolutionary. Uh, the Gospel of Mark says he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So again, he's not just a teacher. He's not just an interesting man with expertise. He had actual authority, we could say, from God. The Gospel of Luke says he is risen. Again, that shows he is the son of God. An ordinary man, never mind a revolutionary man, could not rise from the dead. So that shows, of course, that he was divine. Jesus taught, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. That's a quote you could use for both, I think, because that could show that he is the son of God. He is saying that, uh, you know, the poor, when they get to heaven, will find favour with God. But you could also say that shows he's a revolutionary man because he is on the side of the poor. And the kingdom of God could refer to a transformation of this world, not just a future eschatological state. Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. So again, is that showing he's a revolutionary man? Because he's actually saying that he's ready for a fight. He's going to fight to challenge the authorities of the day to transform society. Uh, St. Paul wrote, Christ died for our sins. So again, his death was not as a punishment for insurrection, but it's the act of atonement. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. A great quote we use when we talk about communion as well, isn't it? But of course, in this context, he is saying that he is the son of God. And then, of course, we can talk about his birth. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. That's the angel Gabriel speaking in the Gospel of Luke. So again, he, he can't just be a revolutionary man. He must be the son of God because of the, the miraculous nature of his virgin birth. So hopefully they've given you something to think about in terms of where Jesus's authority comes from, in terms of who Jesus was, what he wanted to do, and importantly, who he believed he was. So who did Jesus actually think he was? Did he think he was the son of God or was he just a man on a mission to transform Greco-Roman society? So let's talk about Jesus Christ. And remember, Christ is not his surname. He wasn't Mr. Christ. Christ is the title that was given to him, meaning that he is the Messiah that uh, has been anointed by God. So very little is actually known about the historical Jesus. Everything we know about him is from the Gospels. And of course, the big problem here is that they are a biased source. So if we then link back to the first um, source of authority we looked at, which is the Bible, of course, if you believe the Bible is infallible and inerrant, then everything it says about Jesus is going to have authority for you. But if you don't believe that, if you're not a Christian, for example, if we bring in Wittgenstein's language games, if you don't belong to that theistic form of life, then is what the Bible says about Jesus going to have authority? It's not, as we said about Genesis, a scientific textbook. It is not, according to the Catholic Church, intended to convey historical fact. So how can we trust what it says about Jesus? Because, of course, the, the, the Gospels were written by people who wanted to convince others Jesus was the son of God. So, you know, they are enhancements, aren't they? They are embellished because they are not written as factual accounts. They are works of propaganda, we could say. So factually, we do know that he was a first century Jewish preacher, which again shows why the Old Testament is included in the Bible, because, of course, the foundation for Christianity is the Old Testament. Uh, and he is believed, of course, by Christians to be the incarnation of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the son and he is the awaited Messiah, the Christ. Now, we know that after his miraculous birth, which is recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke, he was uh, baptised by John the Baptist. So we don't really hear about his time at school. We don't know what his favourite school lunch was. We don't know what subjects he enjoyed. We don't know how many behaviour points he had or how many detentions he got. But we do know that he was then baptised by John the Baptist. So that is when the story resumes. 
And according to Matthew's gospel, as Jesus emerged from the water, because John the Baptist was practicing adult baptism by immersion in the River Jordan, a voice from heaven said, this is my son. So, of course, that would suggest, wouldn't it, that Jesus is the son of God. And some Christians are adoptionists. They believe that it's at that point that Jesus was adopted by God and chosen by God to uh, do his good work in the world. According to the Gospels, then, Jesus performed 37 miracles. They include walking on water, turning water into wine, feeding the 5,000 and restoring sight. So, of course, if we got a dialogues question on miracles from philosophy and then, of course, um, that dialogue with Christianity, we could bring in the fact that Jesus performed these miracles and that they show for Christians his authority. They show that he was working with divine powers. He also taught a lot, didn't he? He didn't just perform miracles. He had a lot of moral teachings um, and he taught in parables, simple stories illustrating moral messages. He challenged the religious authorities. He reached out to outcasts in society. And of course, he gathered his 12 disciples or apostles. So, you know, he was a busy man, wasn't he, in his short time on earth. And the climax of his life, really, is at the beginning of Holy Week, which is um, the week before Easter Sunday. Because on Palm Sunday, Christians remember him arriving into Jerusalem, which is a really amazing moment for him when everyone comes out to see him arriving on a donkey. But then by the end of the week, things have gone rapidly downhill because Jesus has been arrested by Jewish authorities, handed over to the Roman government and executed on Good Friday, although I don't think it felt like a very good day for him at the time, uh, executed by crucifixion on the charge of insurrection. So, you know, the week starts really well for him. He then cleanses the temple and kicks all the stall holders out of the temple. But yeah, by the uh, Sunday, um, things are back to a good place because he then does rise from the dead. And of course, Christians believe, if we just go back to Good Friday, actually, the reason it's a good thing that he's been killed on the cross is that that is the act of atonement. St. Paul writes, Christ died for our sins. Now, for many scholars or many historians, they believe that the story ends on Good Friday, that the crucifixion of Jesus is the end. And obviously everybody's unhappy, his disciples are devastated, but that is the end of the story. However, Christians believe that that is, of course, not it. They believe that Jesus then rose from the dead on Easter Sunday and then ascended back to heaven 40 days later after appearing to many people. According to Paul, he appeared to over 500 people. Interesting as well, the first person that he appeared to was the Mary Magdalene. So again, if you're thinking about gender and sexuality, if the resurrection is the most important event of the Christian story, what does that tell us? That he chose to appear to a woman first, um, but we'll save that for the gender topic. And of course, Christians still don't believe that Jesus is done. 2,000 years later, they are still anticipating his return, his second coming. So what about his authority? We've had a look there at some key facts about him, primarily based on the Gospels. Where does his authority come from? Is his authority human because he was a revolutionary man who had some good things to say and so people give him authority in their lives? Or was it divine? Let's start with the idea that his authority was from God. This is, of course, your traditional view held by Christians. And it is based on the New Testament and Jesus's claims in this to have divine authority. So you could say that Jesus having God's authority is seen in his teaching, his miracles and the titles attributed to him. For example, he said in the Gospel of Matthew that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He also said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people. So that final line there is a really important line, isn't it? That God has given Jesus authority over all people. Of course, as we've said, his authority being divine is also showcased not only through what he said, but also what he did. So the Gospel of Mark, for example, thought to be the oldest of the Gospels in the Bible, said the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So that is the reaction that he had. He also said, all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son. And I think probably one of the best and most memorable lines from Jesus is, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. 
But of course, we need to then look at the counter argument to this. The idea that his authority is not divine. It's not from God, that he, he can still have authority, but it's not divine authority. And of course, the scholar we'd be referring to here is Reza Aslan, who believes Jesus was a political revolutionary who wanted to transform first century Greco-Roman society. Now, here's the important critique. And this, again, is where we're going to link in the different sources of wisdom and authority, because we're now going to link back to the Bible and the authority of the Bible, which is how we discover things about Jesus. He said that the Gospels are unreliable, uh, that we can't fully trust them. And we've got to be really sceptical when we're reading them. He said the Gospels are filled with theological enhancements and flat out fabrications. So they are not factual accounts. You can't take them as, you know, 100 percent reliable because actually they've been written by biased narrators who are trying to convince their audience that Jesus is the son of God. And of course, the Gospels didn't originally begin as written books, did they? They weren't written down straight away. They weren't following Jesus around with a notebook going, oh, say that again, Jesus, let me make a note. Oh, turn the water into wine again. I didn't quite see that. Let me note it down in my notebook. That wasn't happening. They began as an oral tradition. So it's a bit like Chinese whispers, you could say, in that at the beginning, these stories could have changed and, you know, they could have been exaggerated by those early Christian communities as they passed those stories on. Now, another view, I did mention this before, I think, is adoptionism. This is the idea that God adopted Jesus as his son at baptism. So there wasn't a virgin birth. You don't need to buy into that. But actually... God adopted Jesus as his son. Now, this is in the same way that uh, it was believed an ancient king in ancient Israel was chosen by God to be his earthly representative. So the king wasn't the incarnation of God, but he was adopted by God at their accession when, you know, they're receiving all those holy oils and everything. And they were then meant to reflect God's justice and mercy in their rule. So if we think about Jesus's baptism, when we hear that voice from heaven saying, this is my son, is that what? Christians actually originally believed that he was adopted by God at birth. He was chosen by God to, you know, carry out a very important mission, but he was not actually the incarnation of God. That to actually think that there was this virgin birth and that he was God in human form has been a later addition that has been added on. We also have Unitarianism. Unitarians hold a deist view of the world. So they believe that God created the world, but then has nothing more to do with it. So he's created it, he's done all the hard work, and now he's put his feet up, he's stepped back. They believe God created the world, but then had no further connection with it. So they would believe that Jesus was a spiritual leader who had useful teachings, but there is no divine authority attached to them. So if again, we link these different sources of authority and our critiques of them, that is very similar to the Sea of Faith Network, isn't it? That, you know, you can give the Bible, you can give Jesus authority if you like what they say and if you like what you hear. But that authority is not divine in origin. It is human in origin because you like it, you know, in the same way with this one, you might like a particular spiritual guru or leader. So you give what they say authority, you practice what they preach to you. But that authority is not from God. It is that you choose to give it. So here are some key quotes that we need to know from the specification. Now, unfortunately, I've cut half of one off there, which is not very good planning from me at all, is it? So what I'm going to do is I'm very quickly going to just zoom out. Here we are, guys, a bit of behind the scenes on the PowerPoint here. And I'm just going to make that a tiny bit smaller. There we go. And solved. Touch wood, let's hope. So we are back now with the quotes and we can actually see them. Um, <laughs> Let's start with the first one, because, of course, what Christians think about Jesus and his authority is going to influence how seriously they take his teachings. Because let's be honest, his teachings are radical and they are demanding. So, for example, eye for an eye. He turned eye for an eye on its head. He said, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to um, if anyone wants to sue you. Did I really write that? Sue you. I don't think I meant to put sue. I don't know what I meant to put. If anyone wants to steal from you and take your shirt, let's go with that. Hand over your coat as well. Sorry, I've now got visions of Jesus in court. Um, anyway, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. 
give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So as I say, I'm not sure whether he wanted people to be sued, but what I do know is that the message here is radical. He is saying, turn the other cheek. If somebody slaps you, you should turn your cheek and go, slap this one as well then, go on. If someone wants to steal from you, you should ask them, oh, well, you didn't actually take my wallet. Do you want that as well? Oh, I'm wearing a I'm wearing a Versace bracelet. Do you want to take that? Go on, why not? Oh, I've got a Rolex on. You didn't see that, did you? Here you are. No bother. Have a good day. This is radical. This is, you know, arguably madness. So the fact is, you've really got to believe Jesus is speaking with authority to do these things, don't you? Because if you don't believe he's got God's authority, why would you do this? So this is where it all links in that, you know, obviously the authority you believe Jesus has is going to influence how seriously you take what he has said and how much of what he said you will put into practice in your everyday life. So another example is love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, so again, you know, the, the key message here that I want to convey by giving you these quotes is this is radical. This is demanding. So, of course, yes, it does show Jesus was a revolutionary man. But in terms of his authority, surely only someone that is convinced he is divine uh, is going to actually do this, because otherwise you're surely going to go, well, listen, if he's just a good teacher, I actually don't want to do that bit of his teachings. But if you believe that he is speaking with God's authority and these instructions are not just from Jesus after drinking too much wine, but this is actually God speaking through him, then you're going to do it. So it's all about with this topic, it's all about thinking, how do Christian views about who Jesus was and his authority influence how seriously they take his teachings. You know, if you believe that he is the incarnate son of God, then you are going to do these things, even though they're demanding. He also says, for example, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. So you have got to be 100% certain that Jesus is speaking with authority and that he is correct. Because if he's not and you've given everything away, you, you, you're in a bit of a difficult position. So Always, always link back these ideas about authority to how seriously someone would take something. And that applies to the Bible as well, in terms of how seriously different Christians take the Bible and whether they rigidly follow it or whether they're a bit more relaxed and liberal. The same applies to the church, you know. How much authority do you give the church? Well, if you think the Pope's got papal infallibility, then you're going to take what he says very seriously, aren't you? And then the same applies with Jesus. You know, where does his authority come from? And what is the influence of that on how seriously you would take his teachings? And as I say, if you're not 100% convinced that he's the incarnate son of God, are you really going to be following these radical teachings? So we're going to link the radical nature of his teachings to the authority Christians believe that he has, you know, and so how that inspires them to put put his teachings into action and follow him. As Jesus said, again, take up your cross and follow me. I do hope that's all making sense. And I, I do need to go away. The first thing I'm going to do now is Google, did Jesus talk about being sued? And I, I need to establish that. I will not sleep tonight until I found out where on earth I got that from. Um, so... <laughs> To conclude, before I go and do that, um, I want to just re return, actually, refer back to our 10 mark and 15 mark questions. Hopefully, you are feeling more confident now about answering these questions. And if you would like to have a go at one of them, maybe now after you've watched the video, I would really recommend that. You know, doing practice questions is the best way to be developing your exam technique and of course to be consolidating your understanding. So have a go at this with your 10 markers, make sure you're writing two or three detailed paragraphs of explanation with quotes, examples and explanation. And then of course for your 15 marker, you need to develop that line of argument. So start with a strong thesis statement, then you want to have uh, you know, at least three paragraphs of evaluation that are agreeing and disagreeing one for each, don't muddle it, you know, do agree, disagree, agree would be my suggestion. And then of course, a conclusion where you reaffirm and you really clearly set out your justified judgment as to whether the statement is correct or not. So I do hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much for joining me. And uh, 
good luck is what I want to say. Very best of luck. Right. I'm off to find out whether Jesus wanted suing people or wanted to sue people, I should say. Have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs>